Um, here is the list of uh, involved people. So I, I want to um, acknowledge them also. It's Talia, Dennis, and Bart who contributed, uh, but also our collaborators from uh, Columbia University from chemistry department. It's uh, Avalon and Xavier. Uh, they grow uh, chromium sulfide bromide that uh, they send to us and then we exfoliate it and make heterostructures and then uh, to Spintronics devices. On the bottom, you see the link to the uh, archive preprint that appeared just last week. Um, all right. How do I change it? Okay. Um, Juan did a very great job for me, so I don't have to introduce many uh, concepts, but still I have to um, walk through some, some basics so that later on I can uh, make good arguments for you and explain our uh, results properly so that the message are conveyed. Uh, and the first thing I have to mention, of course, is proximity effects, but again, I will not say much. Uh, but basically, uh, we can combine two materials uh, with two different properties, two, two different functionalities into a single material that is going to have a functionality that is broader than any uh, uh, than functionalities of any of the uh, starting materials. And that is, um, as one mentioned, it, it's a very, very, very nice platform such that uh, one can design um, uh, samples uh, with a various range of different functionalities. So that, that's a very uh, great platform to work on. And then how can we use um, proximity effects uh, for the needs of spintronics? I have drawn here the um, small diagram uh, consisting of uh, building blocks of any prospective or existing uh, spin-based devices, which consists of um, generation uh, of spin signal manipulation of the transport and then detection of the spin signal. And uh, if I look at these blocks from the perspective of layered materials, of course, the first thing that uh, comes to mind is graphene. As we all know, it's, uh, it's an excellent host uh, for spin transport as it has uh, superior quality, uh, the long uh, spin annotation and, and so on. So this is our uh, primary choice um, as a basis for all our heterostructures if we want to talk about spin-based devices. But then uh, the generation or detection or manipulation of the spin signal when it's uh, in graphene cannot be done by graphene itself. So it has to be introduced by something else from the outside world. And it can be done by uh, different layered, uh, other layered materials such as uh, transition multi-tivac galcobinides or <coughs> other ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic materials. And um, the area of uh, TMDs was uh, covered just in the previous talk, but still I will mention uh, the main um, experimental works where people have shown that in heterostructure of layered materials, TMD and graphene, uh, it's uh, relatively easy to observe such effects like pickleization, spin relaxation, time anisotropy, spin hole effect, crowd by time effect, and we also contributed uh, with uh, our papers in this field. But basically, I can safely say here that as a community, we managed to uh, experimentally demonstrate that we can induce spin orbit coupling in graphene, so combine green, uh, uh, red and green color and make, let's say, uh, yellow graphene with the spin orbit coupling. So what about uh, exchange interaction? How can we put it uh, into graphene? And again, in this area, there is a, a list of uh, works uh, that has been done over the last years. And it has been uh, more or less successfully demonstrated that it's possible to induce exchange interaction in graphene via proximity effect. And here are indicated two references um, uh, specifically where the layered materials were used. However, uh, from all these uh, references, experimental realizations and, and devices, uh, in all of them, the induced exchange interaction is either too small in order to be used for manipulation of detection of spin, uh, or it implies the application of very large magnetic fields like few Tesla. So it's practically not very uh, relevant, let's say. And for conceptual uh, realization of uh, exchange interaction graphene, I'm going to put also tick here. But because uh, still this is not good enough for real life applications, I will make it blurry. And then in order to understand what we want to get from magnetic graphene, let me take a bit of uh, detour into non-layered uh, but bulk 3D materials. And this is a cartoon of uh, band structure that I think is familiar to many of you. Um, where the band structure of ferromagnet is shown. And you see that the uh, 
electron states with the spin up are shifted in energy with respect to the electron states of the spin down. And then if there is a, a certain dependence of density of states on energy, at the Fermi level here, I'm going to have a spin polarization of, uh, let's say, number of carriers. So there will be uh, more electrons uh, with the spin up as compared to the electrons with the spin down. And then if I start to uh, uh, pass the charge current through such material, uh, it's going to address mostly the electrons, electron states uh, close to the Fermi level. And therefore, uh, in that current, most of the electrons will be of the red color, not blue. Again, if I actually connect this ferromagnet to the uh, non-magnetic material and pass again the, the charge current, that current, when it enters the non-magnetic material, it cannot uh, immediately drop the spin polarization of it. So the, the spin signal will penetrate into the non-magnetic material and, and further on will decay exponentially. Uh, the band structure of the non-magnetic material is uh, uh, shown here. And since there is no exchange in direction, there is no shift between spin up and down bands, but there are more of spin up electrons somewhere close to the interface. And then uh, this is the mechanism how the spin accumulation is built up. So that's non-equilibrium difference in the chemical potentials uh, between spin up and down. And it is uh, somewhat maximized around the uh, boundary between ferromagnet and non-magnetic material. Now let's see how it works for graphene. Um, basically in exactly the same way. So the band structure gets shifted for spin up with respect to the spin down. And at a certain Fermi level, we are going to have more electrons that are uh, having spin up as compared to spin down. But one of the main differences of graphene with respect to other metals is that it's actually a semi-metal, meaning that the density of states is relatively uh, small. <clears throat> and that means that we can quite effectively tune the position of the Fermi level across the data point. So we can actually bring it all the way up here but here, uh, it's easy to understand that the number of electrons that are blue with the spin down are going to be larger than the number of electrons with the spin up. That means that the polarization of um, number of charge carriers is going to change sign when we go across the direct point. And under some uh, simple assumptions, it's possible to uh, sketch how the graphene polarization defined as a difference in the conductivities for spin up and down divided by the sum will depend on the Fermi level. And you see it's going to get uh, maximized around the point where the Fermi level crosses the, uh, let's say, semi uh, direct point, and it changes the sign when it goes across it. So, and then it decays at large energies. And once uh, we understand that um, the polarization graphene is going to be largely dependent on the Fermi level, what we can do next is actually uh, provisionally assemble. Uh, uh, the sample uh, that we would want to have out of graphene. And it looks like this. So uh, the graphene on top of magnetic substrate is going to have a very large induced uh, proximity exchange interaction in it. Uh, however, half of it we can cover with insulator and a gate such that uh, here we can control the density independently of the density of this part. And then the polarization on the left is fixed, but the polarization on the right is going to follow somehow this uh, sketch here in the middle. And then the two terminal measurements that we can do across uh, this boundary here will contain, of course, the, the regular ohmic part, but also will contain a, a spin-related contribution that uh, will depend on the difference between the polarization between the left and the part, uh, left and right part of graphene. Basically, this structure resembles very much the, the GMR phenomenon. And therefore, if we are able to realize uh, graphene with a large enough uh, spin polarization of conductivity, then we can um, exchange the, the, all the materials that are used for GMR effect with graphene, and, and hopefully it's going to be more efficient uh, low dimension, two-dimensional, uh, and so on. So it can bring quite uh, a number of advantages, especially from the side of the applications. Right, so now I think I have... Um, covered up all the grounds, so I, I can move on to the interesting stuff, what we have done experimentally. Uh, you see here the um, structure of uh, our sample. It's um, CSB uh, bulk, but here I only show a monolayer. CSB is a chromium sulfide bromide. From the side, you see all the uh, atoms uh, that are in the crystal structure. 
chromium bromine sulfur and uh, chromium is the source of a uh, magnetic order it coupled it is coupled uh, via super exchange uh, therefore inside a single layer of csb it is a ferromagnetic however from layer to layer is anti ferromagnet and it's also air stable so that, that's also quite an important fact uh, and especially from the perspective of uh, technology right um, we can exfoliate it, uh, and it gets exfoliated in a very specific shape. So it's, it's always like uh, one dimension is larger than the other one, uh, considerably larger. And from the squid uh, measurements done in Colombia, we know that the easy magnetic axes are always along the short side. When we, um, we can also exfoliate uh, graphene flakes and then find an appropriate one and put on top. So that's exactly what we did. We had... Um, CSB flake that was about 20 nanometers thick, so it's not a mono layer, it's, it's a, a few layers, a few layers thick material with the bilayer graphene on top. And then we put aluminum oxide, cobalt contacts, and magnetic contacts on top. Um, I want to show also these uh, schematics here and emphasize the fact that graphene via proximity will only feel the magnetic order of the very top layer. So it will see CSB as just a magnetic, ferromagnetic material, basically, but the dynamics um, of magnetization is governed by the anti-ferromagnetic behavior. Therefore, this structure is actually quite peculiar from the point that the uh, exchange interaction in graphene here can gain from both worlds, ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic. So, so it, it, it can um, be, uh, again, uh, very nice for, for applications in terms of the speed as well. And on the other side, we can also say that graphene here and the spin transport in such proximitized graphene can give us information about a single magnetic sublattice of an antiferromagnet. So it's from the perspective of graphene as being a tool, it's also a quite uh, um, nice uh, feature of this uh, structure. So um, let me move on to the experiments, uh, the measurements. And the first thing I want to show, because it's, it's also easier to explain it, it's a three terminal measurement. Uh, the geometry looks like this. So we pass the current between uh, middle cobalt electrode and then outer electrode, and then measure the voltage drop between the same middle electrode and the uh, other outer electrode. Here we have graphene on top of CSB. And we have learned before that when we pass the current between the ferromagnetic material into the non-magnetic material, we create a certain uh, spin accumulation somewhere at the boundary that decays exponentially towards the bulk. Uh, and that's exactly what happens here. So the cobalt is a ferromagnet, and when we inject the charge current from cobalt into graphene, we are going to have a finite spin accumulation that will decay exponentially uh, towards both sides. But if the graphene has a large exchange interaction inside, then um, when the current, charge current passing through graphene will be passing through graphene, it will also create a spin accumulation at the boundary between the uh, part where there is no current and the part where there is current. So this interface here resembles pretty much uh, uh, the interface between the cobalt and graphene, between uh, magnetic and non-magnetic part. Meaning, basically, uh, that in this particular structure, there are two sources of spin accumulation. One is cobalt-based, let's say, another one is graphene-based. And then, depending on the relative orientation of the magnetization of the cobalt electrode and CSB, uh, topmost layer, CSB, uh, we can have these uh, two mechanisms acting either constructively or destructively. So now, um, this is the actual experimental result. What we do first, we align uh, magnetization directions uh, of CSB and uh, cobalt in a, a large negative magnetic field. And then starting from zero, we apply positive field. And at a certain point, um, the cobalt electrode will switch to the opposite direction. And therefore, the, uh, these two mechanisms, instead of being uh, added up, they will uh, be subtracted from each other. And the spin signal will just drop down. And it will restore back when the magnetization of CSB also switches back. So it, it basically is, it resembles the, the structure of the spin valve that normally is measured in graphene. Only the difference is that uh, here it's parallel, anti-parallel between the magnetization of the cobalt and CSB. And another point here is that if graphene would be non-magnetic, uh, the measurement here would be just um, flat line, simply because there is only a single mechanism uh, 
for the uh, spin injection, and that the uh, detecting contact is also uh, spin polarized in exactly the same way. Therefore, it doesn't matter if the cobalt is pointing, cobalt organization is pointing this, that way or that way, there will be no difference to you. You will see no switch uh, in this measurement. Therefore, uh, the fact that we measured uh, three terminal spin valve is a direct uh, signature and a proof that the graphene that we have there is actually magnetic. And we confirm um, uh, the fact that this switch is associated with the material if uh, when we compare the um, magnetization dependence of a CSB flake, a separate CSB flake, as a function of the um, magnetic field along the easy axis. So this is Y axis, it is easy axis of CSB flake. And then we also see that there are sharp um, uh, flip transitions uh, around similar field uh, also. So with this, I think it's it's uh, consistently showing that uh, uh, graphene and CSB are playing uh, with each other, and therefore we can uh, measure a three terminal uh, spin valve. All right, we have set up a relatively simple model in order to explain our data. Uh, schematics here basically uh, shows that we assume that there are two channels, uh, parallel channels for spin up and spin down currents. They have separate conductivity, so conductivity for the spin up is different from the conductivity for the uh, spin down, and they are coupled through the uh, relaxation resistance that basically represents any spin relaxation processes. And uh, assembling properly the system of equation, we can solve it analytically and we can come up with a, a non-local spin-related uh, component that is going to look like that. And uh, knowing the switching behavior of the contacts in CSB, we can uh, basically deduce the drop uh, that we see in the three terminal measurement, uh, which is going to be proportional to the spin relaxation length, uh, square resistance, uh, inversely pro proportional to the um, width of the channel. But most importantly, it's proportional to the product of the con contact polarization, cobalt polarization, and graphene polarization. So I'm em emphasizing here again that if the graphene polarization is zero, so it's not magnetic, then this delta RT is simply zero. So we are having a flat line. Of course, uh, this can be uh, taken further uh, towards the non-local transport. So we can also assemble the same expression for the four terminal non-local measurements that uh, was introduced earlier today. And um, uh, people who are familiar with these equations, they basically recognize this part as exactly the same as for normal graphene. And what is different is this uh, term in, in uh, parentheses. And if I open up the parentheses, there are going to be four terms contributing uh, to the total signal. And I'm going to uh, go one by one through them. Right. So the first one is a, a just conventional um, part that uh, is always there also for the non-magnetic graphene. And the uh, uh, part of, uh, so this part of the signal comes from the injection of the spin accumulation uh, when the current is passed between uh, cobalt and graphene. So it's a cobalt based um, spin injection signal, right? And then uh, that signal decays exponentially and then still detected by the magnetic detector because it's coupled to the spin. So it's proportional to the product of uh, both contact polarization injected and detected. The second mechanism is different one because um, the injection happens not because of the cobalt, but because of the, uh, this part of the graphene where the charge current flows. So this part also serves as the source of the spin accumulation that decays uh, along the channel and is still picked up by the detector because it's a magnetic um, spin sensitive contact. So it's proportional to the polarization of graphene times the polarization of detector contact. The third one is reciprocal of the second one. So basically, we also uh, are injecting spin accumulation uh, from cobalt because of the magnetic nature of cobalt that is going to decay towards the detector. And when the spin uh, current flows into the magnet into, uh, inside the magnetic graphene, it also um, is converted into the charge voltage. So basically, this contact, irrespective of being magnetic or non-magnetic, is going to pick up a finite charge voltage that is going to be proportional to the graphene polarization. And the final uh, contribution is coming from the um, uh, graphene itself. So basically, we are creating some spin signal uh, because of the uh, charge current in graphene that decays towards the detector. And while decaying, it gets converted into the charge voltage, uh, which is picked up by the detector, irrespective of its uh, magnetic nature. So 
basically, um, this is the essence of, of um, a non-local transport in magnetic graphene using uh, cobalt electrodes. And you see that uh, even if uh, we don't use uh, magnetically um, polarized, so ferromagnetic contacts, uh, cobalt or permalloy, we will still have a spin-related component that is just proportional to the uh, polarization of graphene squared. Um, based on this formula, uh, we can see that depending on the uh, relative sign of the graphene polarization with respect to polarization of the contact and on the values of all these three numbers, we're going to have uh, like different shapes of the spin valves. And that is how it looks for, for us for this particular sample. We can uh, easily identify three distinctive layer, uh, levels. And uh, by having the full set of non-local measurements and uh, local three terminal measurements and distance dependence non-local measurements, we can easily and unambiguously identify which switch uh, uh, and associate it with a particular contact. So we know that the first switch happens because the injector switches, the second one is because of the detector and the third one, again, above point to Tesla, as in the three terminal measurement, it happens uh, because of the switch of the top layer magnetization of uh, CSB on graphene magnetization. And from the full set of data, uh, uh, we were able to extract the individual polarization of the contacts of graphene and the spin relaxation length also inside the uh, magnetic graphene. But important uh, number here is the polarization of graphene. It's a, it's a conductivity, uh, spin polarization of graphene conductivity, which is actually rather large, it's 14%. It tells us that basically by uh, bringing it in proximity of CSB, we can create a very strong exchange interaction and introduce a coupling between the charge current and spin current that is as efficient um, as in uh, regular uh, magnetic uh, materials like cobalt. We also did um, so-called handle measurements, but um, uh, the only difference <laughs> is that it's not actually a handle measurement because there is no precession present uh, here simply because um, uh, the in in induced exchange interaction is so large, so the effective exchange field is so large inside graphene that uh, all the spins that are not parallel to the magnetization are killed. They're immediately killed. And uh, the only ones that survived uh, are the ones that are parallel to the magnetization of CSB. So let me uh, slowly take you uh, through this uh, curve. Uh, we apply magnetic field along the perpendicular uh, axis to the easy axis of cobalt and CSB. So the easy axis of cobalt and CSB, they coincide. It's, it's along Y axis and we apply a magnetic field along X axis. Uh, at zero magnetic field, all the uh, magnetizations are aligned. So it's, it's the same level as here in the spin valve. And then what happens first is that the, the both detector and injector, they start to rotate because they are softer magnetically compared to CSB. And at certain point, they are going to be just fully aligned with the field, whereas the CSB is going to be just tiltly, uh, slightly tilted. And because they are 90 degrees now with respect to each other, almost 90 degrees, then the spin transport is going to be largely suppressed because they're not parallel. And uh, beyond this point, the CSB also starts to tilt towards the field and finally it will uh, align again with the contacts and then will uh, mostly restore uh, the same level of spin signal as it was here. Now, the difference between all these three levels shown here is the same as between these three levels here. And it is in the um, starting point for the uh, configuration of the C1 and C2 magnetization. But because um, the only difference there is in the uh, configuration of the cobalt contacts, they all merge at this point because they are all aligned, no matter if, if it starts from, from here or from there, right? They all merge at this point. We also assemble a simple uh, theoretical description of this uh, measurement, and it actually resembles quite well uh, even some uh, smaller features uh, in our handles. We also do uh, squid measurements and confirm that indeed the uh, x-axis are hard uh, axis uh, and the magnetization of the CSB saturates somewhere around one Tesla, which is similar to our handles. Uh, next one, uh, next measurement to do would be uh, to do temperature dependence. So from our collaborators, we know that the nail temperature for this material is around 132 Kelvin, meaning that uh, all the magnetic order is that above that temperature. 
So it, it, it will be only paramagnetic. And um, that's exactly what we see in our non-local measurements, basically. So uh, the measurements that I showed before were done at 4.5 Kelvin. That's where the signal is largest here, uh, about uh, 2 ohm maybe. And then it considerably decays basically down to the noise level uh, already at 100 Kelvin. So we can barely distinguish uh, the switch of the material uh, at this uh, black curve. And the same happens for, of course, the HANA measurement. Uh, we start first with the... Uh, very large modulation of uh, order of one ohm, and then at uh, 100 Kelvin, it's almost gone. So um, overall, basically, uh, with these experiments, uh, we can prove and confirm that the graphene on top of CSB is magnetic. Another way to prove it is to measure the uh, second order response. Uh, as it was uh, introduced earlier this morning, basically, if we measure the second harmonic in the locking, uh, amplifier, we will measure the, all the effects that are related to the thermal gradients. And uh, the thermal gra gradient is there simply because uh, when we pass the current between two cobalt electrodes, it also introduces some dual heating. So there will be a thermal gradient from uh, injector towards the detector. Uh, due to the finite Zeebeck uh, effect in graphene, there will be also charge current flowing towards the detector. And because of the magnetic nature of graphene, uh, Zeebeck effects for spin up and down are going to be different. Therefore, we are going to create some uh, spin accumulation that can be detected by magnetic uh, cobalt contact here by a detector. So the, the larger, uh, the, the major difference between this measurement and the first order uh, measurement is that we should not see any switch of the injector. And that's exactly what happens here. So this switch uh, by the value, we can easily identify uh, that it's a switch of the detector and no switch of the injector is absorbed. So it should happen somewhere here if it is there. Um, we also see handle, uh, let's say magnetic field dependence of the non-local signal. And uh, it looks how it roughly should look like. So this is also a theoretical description from us. Um, yeah, so I think uh, I I'm close to the concluding my talk. Um, so I, I'm back to my uh, color scheme. I have shown that uh, we can we have learned already uh, how to combine green and red graphene and TMD and get the yellow graphene. And also I showed now that uh, we can combine blue and red and get uh, cayenne uh, with the graphene with a very large exchange interaction uh, that can potentially uh, uh, be used in uh, applications. And I think the next step would be to combine all three colors together: red, green, and blue and get uh, pure white graphene with everything that we need inside and uh, hopefully it's going to be a salvation a bit of a salvation for our community um, so the major uh, message here is that we can use only layered materials in order to make uh, spin-based devices and, and it is already there um, concluding basically um, I have shown you the results uh, from the uh, linear generation of the spin current, uh, linear signal generation of spin current by the charge current, the thermal generation, uh, uh, thermal gradient based generation of spin current. And also we have observed anomalous hollow effect, which I haven't shown, but we have observed it. And basically all three experiments they, uh, in unison uh, confirmed the magnetic nature of graphene in um, heterostructure structure with CSB. And um, again, so that's the reference to our work. If you want to know more details, and thank you very much for your attention.